All right, praise God. Yeah, we have a bit of ground to cover today. So I want to, I want to, we're going to be sharing on um, protection. And from there, we may enter into other things. Just, just quickly. The scripture I want us to look at is the 91st Psalm. And in the 91st Psalm, you can see clearly the principle of faith in Psalm 91. Protection is God's will for us. Protection is God's will for us. We have heard many stories of people just dying before their time, dropping dead, etc., etc. But within the pages of the Bible, the Lord God has promised us protection. Even in Psalm 91, right at the end, he says, in the last verse, he says, with long life, I will satisfy you. All right? So it's God's will. Now, sometimes we have this... Uh, we have this debate within ourselves, this argument within ourselves concerning God's will. Um, and it may not happen. Um, it may not be what God has had in his mind. But let us get it straight. That whatever God has planned, desired, willed, is written in the scripture. Understand the fact that scripture is the, the covenant we have with God, right? Sorry, the contract, the agreement, the plan, that's better that we have with God is covenant based, right? And God doesn't change it and God doesn't alter it. Now, some people will embrace the covenant and see God's help. Some people will not embrace the covenant or some people don't, do not know how to embrace the covenant and they will not see God helping them. The example again is the kings of, uh, of Judah and the kings of Israel. Some of them were faithful to the word of God and held on to the word of God. They experienced God helping them in battle. Some of them did not hold on to the word of God, did not pray to God, followed idols, and they did not experience God's help, right, in their country, in battle, at war. Are you seeing that? Okay. In order for us to be able to see God's help, we must know the covenant and we must know how to apply it. Let me repeat that again. In order for us to experience God's help, we must know the covenant and we must know how to apply it. Let me say it in a different way. In order for us to see God's help, we must know what God has promised us because every promise in the scripture is covenant based. Okay? Let's continue. Every promise in the scripture is covenant based. So what God has promised, you must know and understand how to apply the promise in your life. Okay? So in Psalm 91, the Bible, I'm reading from the New King James translation. The Bible says this, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Okay? So because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, because of our faith in Christ, we are now in God. Okay? Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, that is the kingdom of God. We are in God, and God is in us. Is that right? He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. We are in the secret place. Okay? We are with God. In fact, the Bible tells us that we are the dwelling place of God's Holy Spirit now. Okay? We are the God's Holy of Holies. We are God's temple now. Are you listening to me? He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. We have a particular and peculiar, exceptional relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Okay? We have a relationship with God now. Now, listen, eh? the fact that we have a relationship with God now and that we are walking in godliness does not secure God's promises for us. Mm -mm. There's something we have to do. We have to apply ourselves. The fact that we have a relationship with God does not fully secure protection for us. Is that okay? We must apply ourselves. Now, we just read Psalm 91 verse 1. In verse 2, the Bible says this. It says, I, okay, who is dwelling in the secret place of the Most High, I, who is abiding under the shadow of Almighty, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in him will I trust. Okay? Now, I want to read from the Amplified Classic, right? The Amplified Classic says this, I will say, I'm really going to read Psalm 91, 
2 and 3. Psalm 91, 2 and 3 from the Amplified Classic. It says, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God. On him I lean and rely. In him I confidently trust. Verse 3, for then, for then, he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. Verse 4, then he will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you shall trust and find refuge. His truth and his faithfulness are a shield and a buckler. Verse 5, you shall not be afraid of the terror. Now, why I'm bringing out this from the Amplified Classic is that it's important that we understand the progression. God's protection, right, is released when we release our faith. The Bible says, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him will I trust. It is then. If you look at your New King James, etc., you will see that the word, the, the word, the first word in verse three is surely. Okay, so if you read it from New King James, we'll say, "I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress; my God in Him will I trust." Then verse three says, "Surely, He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler." Okay, so it's interesting to understand the fact that what connects you to the flow of God's power. What connects you to God's protection is for you to release your faith. You must release your faith for God's power to be channeled into your life. Remember we read uh, 1 Peter where it says, um, we are guarded or we are protected by the power of God through faith. Okay? So we also read 2 Corinthians 4.13. We have the same spirit of faith. As it is written, we believe and therefore we speak. So the way in which we release our faith is by believing, understanding what the Bible has said, and speaking, speaking it out of our mouth in gratitude and in praise. When we do that, we open up the channel of faith, we activate faith for God's power and for God's presence to flow. Now, there's one very frequent question I get when I'm interacting with saints. And it's always about how come bad things will happen to good people, okay? Speaking of accidents, untimely death, etc. you know? And they tell stories of, oh, he was such a wonderful man. He was a great man. He was a deacon in church, and he did so well. And he just goes ahead and, you know, dies in a freak accident, dies in an accident. So I'm always asked that question. Now, why would God allow that to happen? So what I normally do is I will become very doctrinal with people. I begin to ask, is it the will of God for him to die? And they say, they're not, they don't really know. You know, whatever is God's will is in God's mind. Actually, no, that's not true, right? What God has planned for us, what is his will for us, is documented in the scripture. So I will lead them into the scripture and let's take a look. Is this what God planned? What is, God, what is God's plan? Even the saints, is that okay? The patriarchs. Those we've looked up to as an example, they didn't just die in freak accidents. They didn't just die like that. Okay? Right? Are you listening? Even those who were martyred, it was planned. I mean, there was knowledge of them being martyred. God didn't just allow them to just die one day. All right? There was knowledge of that. Okay? So I go into the scripture and I show them. You're walking godly. You are doing good. But are you releasing your faith for God's protection? You see the question? Are you? Because if you are not, right, um, then you're doing something very irresponsible. You've got to believe God for protection, right, on a daily basis, on a weekly basis. Is that okay? Um, there was a particular time, I'm giving you a personal example here, where our kids were in a particular, uh, Jason and Karis were in a particular um, school. It was an oil company, Nigerian NNPC school. And the school is quite a bit of a distance. They have coaches, buses that, you know, will pick up and drop off. On this particular day, um, the buses would normally drop off the kids by four o'clock. It was seven o'clock in the evening. We hadn't seen our kids. And all the parents were at the pickup points in my particular area, and they were worried. In fact, some already started confessing, hey, they've, they've had an accident. Something terrible has happened. And by this time, the drivers, right? Their, their phones had died because everybody keeps on calling, 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 calling. 
My wife and I didn't, we didn't sweat. Why? Because we prayed to the Lord for protection. Okay? We prayed for protection. So the fact that we prayed for protection over our children, we knew that we just can't lose the kids because when we pray, we handed over our children to God. God's presence and God's power was keeping our kids. So we can't just lose our kids. All right? Now, contrawise, understand the fact that I'm going somewhere. Talk about protection, right? G the Lord Jesus, in the disciples' prayer, there, there are two clauses. It says, lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. Okay? Now, it's important that, that please listen, that many times when God wants to protect us, what he actually does is that he leads us. Okay? Um, in waking up in the morning and praying, if something terrible was going to happen that was going to cost lives that particular day, the Lord would minister to my wife and I not to allow our children to go to school that day. Finish. Is that okay? That is if we had taken up the responsibility, right, of devotion, of daily prayer and praying the promises of God. The Lord would minister to us, don't allow your children to go to school today. Is that okay? I'm trying to show you how God protects. Okay? God's protection is not always in manifestation. It's not always that, you know, the plane, the, 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 the vehicle is about to have an accident and all of a sudden you disappear and appear on the side of the road without any injury. It's not always like that. Okay? Many a time, God protects us by leading us. Right? In the avoidance of temptation. Now, listen to this. In order for the Lord to be able to lead you, right, you must know how to be led by the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, there are many ways in which the Holy Spirit leads us, okay? But one very prominent way in which the Spirit of God leads us intuitively is by the experience or the absence of peace in our hearts, in our spirits. Is that okay? Example. If I'm seated in a restaurant and I don't have peace, question, what is God telling me? I actually just asked the question. What is God telling me? I'm sitting in a restaurant and I don't have peace. What is the Lord telling me? I feel very uncomfortable in my spirit being in that place. What is the Lord telling me? Somebody answer, please. What is the Lord saying? Hmm? Go home. The Lord is listening. telling you to leave that place. Yes, it's very The Lord important. is telling the you Lord... to leave that place. Thank you, thank you. So that's how a lot of believers, because they have not been taught, they can actually be in a building, right? They don't have peace. They don't understand what it means, and then the building collapses. Or the building is, you know, raided by armed robbers or something like that, okay? So what I'm saying is that in God's protection, we need to understand the fact that and ask one major way in which God protects his people, right, is by the leading of his Holy Spirit. And you need to be sensitive to God's leading. I know I'm, 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 you know, the point is simple, the illustration is simple, but I want to really hit this home. You are seated in a taxi. You order an Uber, a boat, all right? And you sit in the Uber, and the Uber begins to drive away, and you don't have peace. Tell me what's going on. What's God telling you? Something okay. is about to happen. Get out of the Uber. Some... Yes, yes, you're correct. You're correct. So what I'm showing you is that that's how God, one of the major ways in which God protects his people. That's one of the major ways in which God protects his people. And this peace in your spirit. I know, I know that because of how some of us may have been trained, we have the impression that when God wants to communicate with us, he must always speak. Like, my son, don't take this Uber. Or we get this impression that anytime God wants to communicate, it has to be in a dream or you have to have a vision. Yes, God does communicate subjectively like that. But the major way in which God communicates subjectively to his people is through the witness of the Spirit. You know, having peace in your heart. Another example. You are in a relationship. You have a friend. The friend, the rapport is really good. 
but you don't have peace about your relationship with this person. Your heart is disturbed. You like the person. You love the person. But in your heart, you just don't have peace. Please tell me what God is telling you. Please tell me, what's God telling you about that relationship? Time to exit. <laughs> it, see, this is essential. <laughs> this is so, so, so important. I can't, I can't overstress it. Let's talk about business. You are to buy a house and you see a house that doesn't really meet up to what you really, really want, but you have peace. What's God telling you? It's for you. <laughs> this is it. You see, this is how we make decisions. This is how one of the major ways in which we're meant to make decisions as Christians. And I can let me show you the passage. The book of Colossians. The book of Colossians, the third chapter. We'll read it from King James and then we'll read it from the Amplified Classic. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 15, the Bible says this: and let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Let the peace of God, in the margin, it says, be arbiter or umpire in your hearts, to which also you are called in one body and be thankful. In other words, this experience of peace in your, in your heart, in your spirit, is meant to be the judge, this, the deciding factor, the umpire, the arbiter. When you have decisions to make, this peace, this peace is one of the things you're meant to lean on. Is that okay? Now, in the book of, in the Amplified Classic, it's, trans, it's, it's rendered like this. Listen to this. And let the peace, the soul harmony which comes from Christ, rule, act as umpire continually in your hearts, deciding and settling with finality all questions that arise in your minds in that peaceful state. You see that? So it's important to understand that once you got born again, part of the born again experience, part of the nature of God within you is the peace of God. It's inside. You can be sad and have peace. You can be incredibly happy with a relationship, right? And not have peace. You can be very happy. You see the car, it's lovely. It sounds good. You're ready to pay. You don't have peace. Even your mechanic is saying, buy it. But you don't have peace. Don't buy it. You see, this is incredibly simple, but this is how God's, God gets, out, God's, gets us out of a lot of trouble and helps us to make solid investment decisions. The peace of God can lead you to make the right investment decisions, even when nobody else can see it. When nobody else can see the benefit, right? God can lead you to make that investment. Right, that will bring benefit to you, profit, profit to you, etc. I think we understand what we just said. Now, in the same um, vein, I want to just read uh, the book of Isaiah, the, the 55th chapter, just to buttress my point. Isaiah chapter 55, the Bible says, says this, okay? Where are we? I'll, I'll read from the New King James translation. Isaiah 55, verse 12. Look at this. It says, For you shall go out with joy and be led out with peace. Okay? You shall go out with joy and be led out with peace. It's important you understand what the Bible is saying here. Anywhere God is leading you to, brother, sister, please, there will be peace. Anywhere God is leading to you, leading you to, brother, sister, there will be peace. If there's no peace, don't go. Just don't, don't. Because as you are going, God is not with you. You're on your own. Okay? Are you listening to me? Now, in paraventure, you are arrested. I mean, you're going to you're going to prison and you have peace. It's not your not, not because you're persecuted by Christ. And you have peace in your spirit. Be very sure that as you're going to that place, God is right there with you. An example, the Bible says that the Lord Jesus was led into the wilderness to be tempted. He was led, yes, he was led. It's possible for God, listen to what I'm saying. It is possible for God 
to lead us into very troubling situations in order for us to shine the light is possible. It is actually possible. Okay? But if the Lord is leading us into that situation, we will have peace. Watch this. And in that situation, he will be with us. You know, in our faith, we sometimes think that God only leads us to nice places. I'm not, I'm not going out, out of the point. I'm just emphasizing this thing about peace. God can lead you to where you don't want. God, and I say this to everybody, God will lead you to serve people that you don't like. God will lead you to minister to people, to reach out to people, to give, to love unconditionally people who you don't like. But you know the good thing? You will have peace when you're doing it. Okay? Emotionally, yeah, you may be distraught, but you will have peace in your spirit. To tell you that God is with you. That God is with you. You know, Scripture says in one place, eh? Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. It says, don't be worried about anything, but in everything, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let all your requests be made known unto God. Right? So once you are prayed and giving thanks, you release your faith. God releases his presence and his power. And one of the signs that God is at work and God is working on that matter is, is the next verse. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. So peace, joy is a sign. I mean, come on now. I, I, I want to speak more about this subjective experience of peace. You are in a situation. You prayed. I'm repeating myself. You prayed. It's like things are not working. But you prayed. But you have peace in your spirit. Tell me what that means. That means God is at work. God is at work. And you're about to experience the manifestation. Are you listening to what I'm saying? I remember a, situ I remember a testimony of a lady who went on holiday. Yeah. While on holiday... She fell sick with an incurable disease and she became paralyzed. You know? Was it neck down? Yes. There's a, there's a movie on it. It's a Christian movie. It's a true story. Now, they're, they're a Christian family. They experienced that attack. So, in one scene, the husband and the son, they're, they're in conversation. And they're like, son is like, dad, I don't understand Mom's condition is terrible. They say it's incurable, but I have peace. And dad says, that's the problem I'm having too. Mom's situation is incurable, but I also have peace in my spirit concerning this matter. Now, that incurable situation that left her a vegetable, right? She got her healing. That's why they made a film about it. But what I'm saying is that before the healing manifested, the family had peace. They had peace. So your, your internal environment, you, you got to watch it. You understand what I'm saying? If you don't have peace about something, if you, have, if you don't have peace about something, you, you need to, you know, re reposture yourself and reposition yourself. You understand what I'm saying? You know? So that, that your internal environment is something you need to watch out for. The Bible says that God, um, that our taskmasters will be, will be peace and righteousness. Okay? In the book of Isaiah. So but the Bible is telling us two things that God uses to lead us in life, you know, that we submit to. One is righteousness and one is peace. Is that okay? To make it, to, to okay, let me explain it better. If God is leading you in a particular direction, okay, let's talk about, let's say marriage. God will not lead, God will lead you in righteousness concerning marriage. He will not lead you to marry a Buddhist. Okay? So, um, <laughs> yes, peace and right, yeah, peace and righteousness. That's it. You know, God will not lead you to marry a Buddhist. Why? Because God's right, righteous standard is that you must not be unequally yoked. You must marry somebody who who has borne the fruit of Christianity. Is that okay? Number one. Number two, peace. Peace is another way that God leads us. Both of them together. So you have four brothers in church who are. Christians who want to marry you. <laughs> Let's, for the sake of illustration, who is the person? Well, God will give you peace about one of the four because they fulfill the righteous requirements 
but then the specific direction the peace of God in your heart will lead you. Okay, do you understand what I'm saying? So we've seen a situation where people um, throw away God's righteous demands and want God to speak to them. Oh Lord, uh, this Muslim man has paid my, has, has, has sponsored my education. Oh Lord, he said he wants to marry me. Oh Lord, is he my husband? I mean, that's, it's even wrong praying that kind of prayer. But then again, the Bible says that in the book of Ezekiel, that God will answer you according to the multitude of idols that are in your heart. So it's possible that with that kind of prayer, you neglecting the word of God, if I'm in that spirit, will come and tell you, yeah, he's your husband, go ahead, marry him. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So God uses two things, righteousness and peace to lead us. You must know the word of God. You must know God's righteous guidelines concerning relationship, concerning how to live life, how to conduct yourself. And then you must watch out for the peace of God within your spirit. It's very important that there are dangers everywhere. People, people mask their intentions everywhere. But God lives inside you, child of God. And the peace of God will always help you discern who is of God and who is not of God. Are you listening to me? In, in, in my work, we've had situations where people have asked for partnership and alliances with our ministry. And I just didn't have peace. So what did I do? I'm not that smart. I just want to be obedient. What did I do? I just didn't do the alliance. The partnership? No, I didn't do it. Then I heard about what those guys did to somebody else afterwards. I was like, oh, thank God. That would have seriously troubled me and brought some tears. It's okay. Even, you know, I'm, I'm right here, for instance. I told Pastor Rami, I'm, I should have been in the field since Tuesday. Monday, I had no peace. So I called the, the bus company and said, hey, I'd like to postpone my trip to Wednesday. Tuesday, I'm packing. In fact, I should have, my wife knows how I pack. I start packing early, start planning early, go to, go to the supermarket, get, get some of the things I need. I didn't even bother doing anything. I didn't have peace. I waited in the evening again. No peace. I called the bus company. I'm sorry, I can't make it. You know, I called, I called all my guys in the field. Sorry, I'm not coming. You know, why? I don't have peace. I, that's all I'm going to explain. And like I told Pastor Rami, I either saved my life or saved myself from a world of trouble. If I now said, no, we have meetings already scheduled in certain villages, I must go. All right? Then I'm not allowing God to lead me not into temptation. Is that okay? The peace of God. Make your decisions based on that. It's, it's essential. I'm, I'm appealing to you. It's one aspect of um, um, protection that a lot of us don't look at. Some are like, ah, let's just pray. Just pray. Just pray. Even if you don't feel, even if you don't have peace, just pray, but still go. No, 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 no. No, at all. Pray. If the peace is not there, don't go. If you pray, let us say, for instance, you feel disturbed and then you pray and you pray through and peace comes, then you can go. But I tell you, the Bible says in the book of Isaiah 55, we just read, you'll be led forth with peace. Don't take a step in that direction if you don't have peace. I plead with you. Don't. Please, oh, please remember we're not alone. We have the Holy Spirit with us. And you, you please understand the fact that when I say we have the Holy Spirit with us, we have God living inside us. Kai, we have God living inside us, child of God. Okay? And sometimes the way we make decisions is such that we totally neglect the fact that Almighty God dwells within the believer. It's dangerous. Right? And you know, I've been, I've, been, I've been meditating very deeply about the fact that um, we, limit, we are limiting ourselves because we are not recognizing the presence of God's Holy Spirit within us. Okay? Even there's a passage of the Bible, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, that says, Now unto him, listen to this, who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we could ever ask or think according to the power that is at work within us. There's a power at work within us, but many times we don't recognize it. In the Ephesians prayer, part of the prayer is for us, is, is for God to open our eyes, right, to the power that is at work in our lives. The power, the Bible calls it like this, it calls it the power to us who believe. The Bible now describes that power that it was the power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead and seated him far above principalities and powers. There is a power at work inside us, believer. And that power leads us in life, wants to lead us in life. 
wants to direct us in life. But we got to, we got to recognize that there is the Holy Spirit in our lives. We, we can't continue neglecting the Spirit of God if we want to live fulfilled lives. Okay? We can't. We can't. Okay? We, we can't. I mean, come on. There, there's a story. Whew, is this good enough? There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a story. So apparently it's a true story of a particular basketballer that was asked to coach a particular league. He didn't know any of the players, but he was asked to coach them. You know, he didn't know any of the players. So he put them through training and everything, and it was time to play the first match. And he picked his five starters, got them on the, got, got them on the court to begin to play. Are you following me? While they were playing, a scout who was in the stands came up to him, tapped him on the shoulder and said, Coach, how come you're not playing your number one? He said, who? You're number one. He said, yes, 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 I'm not playing him. He's sitting down there. He said, but your number one is the best player in his age group in the whole of the country. The coach was like, what? Are you serious? He said, yes, he's the best. So the coach just simply said, oh, yeah, number one, come here. All right, so who, who's, who, who are you gonna, who's, who, who's gonna go off? He said, number one, you decide who's gonna go off. So the number one comes and they win the match and they're winning all their matches. Now, what, what, <laughs> so, so what that tells me, right, is that using that illustration, we have, we have somebody in our lives, we don't even recognize how powerful, how skilled, how knowledgeable he is. But the Bible says he lives inside me. Your Bible says the Holy Ghost dwells within you. But we completely neglect him. And this becomes a danger in our lives. A danger in our lives. That we have God living. Jesus Christ said he's, he's not going to leave us as orphans. Right? But he will give us another comforter. Allos Paragletos. The Holy Spirit. Somebody just like him who will come and stay with us. To guide us and to enable us to walk in victory. To show us Jesus. And this person, the Bible says, actually lives inside you. It's amazing, isn't it? He lives inside you. Some of you are here. I'm going backwards. You've entered into friendships that you're, as believers, you knew in your spirit, nah, I'm, I'm not at peace. And the person betrayed you. You still went along with it. And the person hurt you and distracted you. That's a good word, distracted you. Some of you also here have entered into relationships with people that, I mean, the relationship, you had peace. And what happened? It added to you. It added to you. It's okay, right? But in these days, in this generation, at this time, in your life, you cannot neglect and you cannot ignore the very presence and power of the Holy Spirit, right? The Spirit of God was given to you to live the Christian life. Now watch this. I'm going to make some statements. The life of following Jesus cannot be done alone without the Holy Spirit. These are some closing statements I made last week. You are not meant to live this life alone. Let's go further. You are not meant to live the Christian life in your own power. Now, making that statement, some of us will be like, what does that mean? Good. I'm glad you don't understand what it means. Why? Because it means an experience you've not entered into yet. The Christian life is not meant to be lived in your own power, in your own strength. It's meant to be lived in the power of God's Holy Spirit. So can you now see that you have something to learn? Are you listening to me? Some say it doesn't matter. No, you have to commit the sin. You have to do this. There's no choice. You're a human being. Thank you for saying that. That tells you you have a lot to learn. You don't actually understand the power of Christianity. Yes, we've seen a lot of people mess up as Christians because they also they don't know the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me give you an illustration again. I'm walking down the street and I have five pounds in my pocket. I'm walking down the street. I have 500 naira in my pocket. Or I'm standing at the bus stop during rush hour. Or I'm at the tube during rush hour. There are a lot of people around. I have five pounds, 500 naira. How would I stand? But for some reason or the other, this is an illustration. I find myself during rush hour queuing up for the tube. People are everywhere, pressing everywhere. And for some reason, I have 20,000 pounds in my pocket. 
or I have 1, 000, uh, 1 million naira in my bag, how would I carry myself? How would I stand? Now, the awareness of what you are carrying would determine how you posture yourself. If you're not aware, if you, if you, I mean, if you're not carrying anything expensive, you will be loose. You'll be free. But if you're carrying something expensive, you become very cautious and very guarded. Very guarded. Are you listening to me? You are carrying God's Holy Spirit. But then you walk around as if you, you have nothing. You have the power that created the heavens and the earth dwelling on the inside of you. Wow. Yes. One of the missing links is that we don't understand that God gave us the Holy Spirit to walk in victory. This life cannot be, you, are, you need to become aware. You need to become aware. And there's a prayer for that in the book of Ephesians chapter 1. There's a prayer for that awareness, for that revelation, for that consciousness. There's a prayer for that. I will show you shortly. Okay? So we started by talking about protection. And we said that protection will not fall in your lap like overripe mangoes. They won't. You've got to believe for it. You've got to apply the promise of God. Because protection is a covenant promise. God will protect. Nuclear holocaust, you believe God, God will protect you. Let me, let me, let me just tell you another story. Those who pioneered um, the full gospel business and fellowship, the Moshakiran's family, they were, I think, Armenian Christians or something. While they were there in one of their meetings, the Spirit of God told them that they should migrate. They should leave their country. There's something terrible is going to happen. So the Shakirans, their family and everybody, they all left for America. Those who are not born again and those who do not believe the prophecy, they stayed behind and they were wiped out by the Turks. They were massacred. Okay? You see how God protects? One of, the, one of the ways God protects is by the leading of the Holy Spirit. If something terrible is going to happen where you are, I remember a family many years ago, they were praying and it just dropped in their spirit. Leave this house before August. So what did they do? They were, it was a rental. What did they do? Before August, they moved in accordance with the word of the Lord. That's Christianity. How amazing that God is there for us and God is watching us. Are you listening to me? So protection, you believe God and God will work. But when we're believing God for protection, you need to understand the fact that his power and his presence may give us guidance. Take the guidance, please, and be safe. Is okay? I have too many stories. I have a friend who was asked to come to his uh, village and um, for a meeting, a very important meeting. So he was to leave Lagos on a Friday night and return to Lagos on Sunday for church and for work. So we have these things in Nigeria called night buses, yeah? Coaches that travel at night. Because if it's a 10, 12 hour journey, you can leave in the evening, get there in the morning. So he gets to the terminal, he pays for the coach, he goes to sit down and he doesn't have peace. He just doesn't have peace. I mean, he just paid a lot of money for this ticket. So, it, but he doesn't have peace. And that's the thing, isn't it? You're waiting for God to speak. God already spoke. So he got down. What's he going to do? Okay, let him, get, let him get his money back. What about the family meeting that's so important? Let's obey God first. So he sells his ticket. And the minute he sells his ticket, he has peace. Okay. All right, that means I can travel. He buys another ticket. The first bus is gone. He takes the second bus. About six hours into the journey, about where the... This is Nigeria, right? Where they cross the Niger Bridge between Asabana and Nicha, Head Bridge. He sees the coach that he would have taken on fire. And about two, three lives were lost. And those were the people sitting at the back where the engine is, where he was to have been seated. So he comes to church on Sunday and tells us, right? Very significant. Why? My brother didn't lose his life or get terrible burns because he recognized the peace of God inside. The urgency to go to the village was not as important as the sensitivity to God's spirit. Did you see that? 
So important. That's how my brother's life was saved. Married with three kids. Okay? So I don't know why I'm emphasizing this this evening because we have not even gotten past the third verse of Psalm 91. Okay? But it's important. Don't play with it. In your relationships, in your, in your movement, in everything you do, be sensitive to God's Holy Spirit. Be sensitive. You've got to be sensitive. It's so important. It's so important because he is there. He is there to guide you. Okay? He can see things you can't see. He is hearing conversations that you can't hear. Are you listening to me? Right? So it's important to lean on that relationship. Is that okay? Now, one very wonderful prayer to pray, to have an intimate relationship with God's Holy Spirit, is simple. Lord, I want to have an intimate relationship with your Spirit. Simple prayer. And then, of course, repentance is important. Father, forgive me for not yielding to your Spirit. Then, in the book of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17, there's a prayer. I'm going to read it out. And it's a prayer I prayed. I pray. I don't pray it as often, but between 2000 and, sorry, between 1993 and um, Around the time I met my wife, 2000 and what? 6, 2007. I prayed it every day. Um, met multiple times a day. Um, when when people ask for prayer requests, that's all. This is it's Ephesians chapter 117 and Colossians 119. That's all I pray for. I never asked for anything. Never asked God for anything. Nothing, nothing. Just this. I want to have revelation. So this is the prayer. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17. I will read to the end, if you don't mind. Please listen. Ephesians 1, 17. The Bible says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know, number one, what is the hope of his calling? Number two, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? Watch this. Number three, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power? Toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places. Now, this prayer does three things. It opens your spiritual eyes to the hope of your calling, the inheritance in the saints, and the power to us who to believe. So it's an important prayer to pray daily for yourself. When you begin to pray this prayer, you will begin to understand the Bible in a, in a dramatic way. The next prayer is Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. And it says this, For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That's the prayer. Now, what's the result of the prayer? This will cause you to walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. You'll be strengthened with might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. <laughs> all right. So these are the two prayers that I, we call them Holy Ghost inspired prayers. They are in the word of God. Personalize these prayers for yourself. And you will even discover as you pray these prayers for yourself, a hunger will begin to grow in your heart for the things of God like never before. Pray these prayers. I, I remember, the stories are long. Whew. I remember, you know, having, you know, doing counseling and people were coming and talking about their spouse and everything. And I said, okay, let's pray this prayer. I said, pray this prayer for your spouse three times a day for the next seven days. And their marriages turned around. Why? Because the spouse is born again. They're born again. Once your spiritual eyes are open, you start acting like a fool. <laughs> Did you understand what I'm saying? Once your spiritual eyes are open, you will stop acting like a fool. Once your spiritual eyes are open to certain things, you, you find that when I say, hey, let's do Bible study, you won't, you won't argue with me. Let's pray, you won't argue. When I say, hey, have you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? You know, have you speak in tongues? No, I don't believe in speaking in tongues. No, when you pray this prayer, you will understand. The Spirit of God will lead you into the experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and you will desire it. So you've got to understand about that. Where we are now in the place of desire, is not where God wants us to be. Remember what I said when I said that you can't live this life in your own strength. You cannot. You can't. 
And if you think you, if you don't understand what I'm saying, then you haven't entered into the experience, right? Of experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit. Are you seeing this? All right. So this, this is where I'd like to round up this evening. Um, the prayers are in Ephesians chapter 1, 17 to the end. Please personalize it. Pray it for yourself. And Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. We are, we have always been, but let me just say it like this. We are in dangerous times. And it's essential for us to please be sensitive. The peace of God will guide you. God will lead you intuitively. I remember, personally speaking, early last year, I started feeling uncomfortable about my, my daughter's university education. I understood what that meant. The Lord was impressing upon my heart. Let me they start praying about Caris's university education. And I prayed through over a period of months. My wife didn't know what I was praying. Well, I didn't, I didn't inform her until I finished praying. Now, concerning my daughter's university education, I have peace. You see how God deals with us? A desire for God to always speak, 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 speak. Talk, 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 talk. You know? is not the best. Study the scriptures. Does Holy Spirit talk? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Okay. But to think that that's the only way he communicates, no. The major way he communicates is with the witness of the spirit. What I'm calling peace in your spirit. Is that okay? We are blessed, honestly. We're not alone. You know, sit down. I ask the young ones here. Sit down and, and pray about your life. Begin to pray about your life. You will discover that when your thoughts go to a particular area of your life and you don't have peace, he's telling you to pray about it. I have, my friends, my daughter's education, um, my daughter's university, I actually didn't have peace. I had to do some fasting so I could pray more concerning that matter and hold on to the promise of God for provision and for guidance. Is that okay? You know? So I, I hope you understand what I'm saying. The spiritual life is a wonderful life. Okay? And it's a life that we need to learn how to live. Walking in the spirit is not just going to church on Sunday. Okay? Walking in the spirit is walking in the spirit. There are a lot of things involved. But we have to learn how to do it. If we think that, let me just go to church on Sunday, after that, drop my Bible and that's it, then you are not walking in the spirit. You are not in step with the Holy Ghost. Is that okay? You know, um, somebody, I'm ending this thought with this thought. Um, I think it's a famous thing on the internet now. There's a pastor who gets a bodybuilder to come to church. John, he's preaching. And he says, this bodybuilder and I, we go to the same gym. So the pastor takes off his shirt and he's not as ripped. I'm ripped, chap. He's not as ripped as the bodybuilder. And he said, do you know why? He said, the answer is this. This guy takes, when gym is over, he still takes the gym home. He watches what he eats. But me... I go to the gym. Once I leave the gym, it's over. I eat what I like. I do what I like. And that's why you can see the difference in our physique and in our fitness. And what he was trying to say is this. Eh? Many of us go to church on Sunday. Once church is over, we take our Bibles, drop them, and that's it. That's it. That is it until next Sunday. But if you really want the spiritual life to help, once you come back from church, you're going to have to keep on being spiritual throughout the week. You have to take the lessons you've learned in church, the lessons you've learned in fellowship, you've got to apply them. You've got to maintain a spiritual walk on a daily basis. You must stay, stay in step with God's Holy Spirit. He lives in you. Amen? He lives in you. If you keep on neglecting that, you are troubling your own soul. If you would say, okay, Holy Spirit, you live in me. I want to know you. Then you become your own best friend. I'm telling you, you are helping yourself by praying, Lord, I want to know the Holy Spirit. I really want my spiritual eyes to be open. I want to know how to live this spiritual life. Show me, help me. I want to be hungry for the Bible. If you have no desire to read the Bible daily, it's a problem. Just like somebody, yeah, get this now. Just like somebody who has no desire for food. You know, if somebody goes through days without no desire for food, what do you call the person? Sick, right? Abby? The worst thing for a parent when you see a baby and the baby doesn't want to eat, you get scared. Imagine Christians who refuse 
to read the Bible or meditate in it and refuse to pray. It's scary because you know they don't they won't have the strength to live the Christian life. Praise God. So I just want to stop here. We have a couple of minutes. Do we have any questions quickly before we go or any contributions? I have a question. Okay, yeah. I, I don't know if it's a question or oh, okay, I'll just say what's on my mind. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll just say what's on my mind. Okay, so <clears throat> about this not having peace, you know, mm -hmm. as a way of the Holy Spirit leading us. I had I used to have a peculiar experience because I had this thing, I, I was always anxious and afraid. Okay. Especially when my kids were little and they were about to start school. So releasing them to the school bus, they'll be fear in me and all of that. So mm -hmm. I there was a point I used to confuse it with whether the spirit the Holy Spirit was telling me something. As in, you know, that lack of peace. Mm -hmm. So I had to walk through that. At the, there was a time I just said to myself that the Holy Spirit doesn't lead through fear. I had to tell myself that and pray so that I will become calm and actually know what is going on in my heart. Because that fear used to cloud, um, will I say my mind or my spirit, that fear clouds so much that I cannot, I wouldn't know what to do. I'll be confused. Is this the Holy Spirit telling me uh, not to put them in this club, not to put them in the swimming club, or is it my fears of them drowning or something like that? You know, that, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. I had to walk through it and be able to differentiate between my own anxieties and the spirit leading me. Because sometimes um, I feel like I'm going out. I feel like there are, there are two ways to get to where I'm going to. Uh, I feel like don't go that way, go this way, I'll go. But I couldn't say when it was the spirit leading me or it's just guesswork, you know, or it's just, uh, I'm just um, anxious or something like that. So I had to walk through that to, to be able to know when I'm, anxious about something and when the Holy Spirit is actually taking my peace away concerning a, a, an action or something I'm about to do. So absolutely, it's not a question, but it's uh, you could say something it's, about it, that. No, it's, it's absolutely because I mean, for us, absolutely, um, being, being able to know the difference. And one of the ways you're able to know the difference is by meditating in the word of God. You get me? Meditating in the word of God Praying can help you know the difference between um, lack of peace, God inspiring a lack of peace, and you being anxious. Is that okay? Um, I was to preach somewhere, and I had about four different ways of getting to the place. I could drive. I could take a speedboat. I could take um, an Uber. I could take um, a bus or a taxi to another route. Four different ways to the place. And while I was praying, I planned that, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm just going to take a speedboat, then stop, take a taxi, and I just didn't have peace. And my, my wife that morning was like, are you okay? What's up? What's up? I said, I'm trying to decide exactly how I'm going to get to this place. He said, why? I said, no, no, no. I just feel uncomfortable about taking a speedboat. I feel uncomfortable about taking a taxi, the long routes. I don't want to drive. And... Um, I just, I just have to be still in God's presence and just believe God, just pray. So in the end, I took a taxi through the long route. And while I was in the taxi, I met a police officer I've been looking for. Um, I met a pastor's wife in the taxi that wants me to come and preach in their house. In fact, they had a very interesting experience with me, you know. And it was a very pleasant experience. And the longer route was actually ended up being actually shorter because they fixed the road. So I didn't even know. So what's my point? Here I am trying to figure out how does God want me to do it? What do I do? Just pray. Just, Father, thank you because I believe you're guiding me. Thank you, Lord. And just chill. Is that, is that okay? Hmm? Is that okay? Is there anybody else? Oh, yeah, quick, quick. quick. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to everything. I'm thinking to myself, God is not a God of confusion. Yeah, because sometimes when we are, yeah, God is not a God of confusion. Sometimes, in the name of, um, oh, uh, uh, I'm listening, I'm, I'm, I'm obeying the leading of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is speaking to me. You know, so I've, I've been in situations where, at work, for instance, where somebody comes into work and says, 
I didn't show up because Holy Spirit said I shouldn't come. Or because I felt, you know, and they have the boldness because they know their boss, their line director is a Christian, you know. And, you know, they, they, they tend that those kind of excuses often. You know, and we have had to say to them, God is not a God of confusion. You know, so please, um, um, babe, can you say something about, about that? How, where does it, where do we draw the line? I mean, you know, like Sarah has just said that, you know, she's, she, she was always having anxiety. At what point does it become irresponsible? At what point does it become? You have to unmute, Oli. Oli, you have to unmute. All right, so you don't go to work because apparently you claim the Holy Spirit says you shouldn't come. They should sack you. Is that okay? Because I don't know why you didn't use that language. Do you understand? I don't know why you use that language, right? Um, God protecting us, right, is not for us to carry Christian lingo up and down. Now, if God does, if 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 somebody is saying God told them not to come, go to work, right, I think the person is talking nonsense. Okay. Now, if there was a bomb, a bomb blast, right, near their place of work, and then the Spirit of God didn't tell them, then that would make sense. Is that? Do you understand what I'm saying? That would make sense if some major incident took place. But if not, nah, you can't. You can't say that. You know, a lot of people will come and um, they'll get to work and uh, they're not productive. They're sleeping at work. And why are you sleeping? He said, the Holy Spirit woke me up to pray in the night. That's why, you know, I, I couldn't sleep. No, no, no. That person, that person is being led by a familiar spirit. That's not the Holy Spirit. Do you understand? Do you understand what I'm saying? If the Spirit of God is going to wake anybody up to pray at night, it's going to empower you to pray, strengthen you to pray, and it won't make you mess up at work. It will, it will give you grace when you get to work. You understand what I'm saying? That's how we know. So, Pastor Rami, eh? that's how you know that, you know, during John Wesley's ministry, when people were falling under the power, falling out of trees, you know, and everything, we know it was the Holy Spirit. Why? Because when they fell, they didn't get injured. So, but when you see people now who are falling in church and breaking their heads, Right? And injury, you know it's not the Holy Ghost. Do you understand my answer? It's not the Holy Spirit. We have someone in church. Oh, I could tell you a thousand stories of people getting hurt in church. You know, the Holy Spirit is moving. The Holy Spirit is moving. This one does this, slaps this guy, gets a black eye. You say Holy Spirit. What Holy Spirit? That's not the Holy Ghost. If the Holy Spirit moves you in such a way, right, there will be no injury. I'm telling you. You will smash. I've, I've seen people smash their heads against the wall. Right? And no concussion. Holy Spirit. But I also see people who have hit their heads against the wall. You definitely know that that was not the Holy Ghost at all. You know? So where the Spirit of God is involved, there will be peace. There will be safety. There will be security. There will be grace. Is that okay? All right. Praise God. All right. We need to start rounding up now. Praise God. Praise God. Yeah. Can I share something? All right, yes, yes, please do. Uh, you know, when you say, uh, Pastor Ollie, it's, um, it's the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit. He who dwells in the secret place shall abide uh, under the shadow. And as it says, he whose mind is stayed on him, he will keep in perfect peace. And many a times when we have to make decisions, it can cause anxiety. But when we're in the word, we know that when God says, be anxious for nothing, it's not an option, it's a command. And he'll bring it into remembrance. If I'm getting flustered about something because I don't know what to decide, he'll bring to my remembrance his word, be anxious for nothing, but in prayer, request, supplication, thanksgiving, you know, present present your, uh, your request to, to me. And so when you were talking about, um, about the Holy Spirit too, in Ephesians, it says in 6.10, it says, uh, be strong. Let us be strong in the power of his might. And that is, that, that's what we cultivate. That's our journey with the Lord, that sweet fellowship with the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Spirit. There was um, one thing that, um, uh, there was a scripture in Ezekiel that I didn't quite uh, 
put it down. What what was that scripture, Pastor Oli? You you mentioned it. Uh, what is it again? Um, what's his name? God would answer you according to the multitude of idols in your heart. Uh -huh. what, what, what it's Ezekiel, no? Let, let me yeah, let me find it. Okay, it's um, it's Ezekiel fourteen verse four. Ezekiel 14, verse 4. Thank you. And there's just one other thing that I don't understand. But, you know, when I don't understand things, I'll put it on the shelf. For example, people like David Wilkerson, who died in a car crash. Miles Monroe, who died in a plane crash. I'm not going to go there. But I just want to say that my spiritual father was Kenneth Hagen. And I loved it. He said one morning at the breakfast table to his wife, my love, he said, at 10.30, I'm going. <laughs> and at 10.30, at the breakfast table, the Lord took him. And I, and I always say to the Lord, I say, you know, because in the world they say that, you know, when you're getting older, you know, you're getting this, that, and the other. And I said, Lord, when you take me or if Jesus comes, I don't have to be sick. I don't have to be ill. You can just take me. Amen. <laughs> don't have to be sick to go well <clears throat> hallelujah 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 praise god all right <laughs> wow so i was doing a teaching on protection and uh, sincerely, I felt the Holy Spirit um, put the words concerning the peace of God on my lips to share on that. So let us be sensitive to God's peace because in it is our protection, is our safety. Amen? God Can bless I say something you. Pastor, quickly? Yes, yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'll be raising up my hand and waiting for you to call me. Okay, okay. Okay, okay so... Um, I wanted to add this, that sometimes the Holy Spirit gives us that peace. We don't understand because in the, it's in the midst of chaos. We're supposed to be tearing out our hair and, you know, getting really anxious and angry and sad about certain events in our lives. And we just don't understand why we're not. And that happened to me. That was my experience like um, months back, almost a year now. Um, I run a school and one of my parents pulled out his child and I didn't understand why, but I had this peace and my, my staff would come to me and say, Ma, don't you think we should go after them? I, I said, no, I have peace. That passes of understanding. I don't understand it. I don't know why, but I just have peace and I don't want to go after something that left me and I got my peace. And the a particular lady who is also a pastor's wife looked at me like this woman is crazy, you know. But months after, I told her I don't. I essentially I don't understand why I have peace. I should be angry because I didn't do anything wrong, and I think that this man is just being an angry. But I had peace. So months after, I think about eight months after. Um, one evening, my husband told me that he saw the man and the man looked at him and said that, I think I want to bring back my, uh, my daughter. Um, don't close the door yet. Uh, we might just be coming back. And aside from that, I called the wife later and I discovered that the younger son, the younger child who was supposed to join the older sister in my school has been very sickly. And this man is someone who is so finicky. I'm sure if he had registered the child and the child became sickly in my school, he was going to be bringing torchlight to my school and looking for why the son was falling ill. So that was when I understood. It dawned on me that, oh, this is exactly why. Yeah, I thought I was crazy, but now I understand. It's just that peace that passes all understanding. It's not every time that we understand why, but we just get that peace and we know it's the Holy Spirit. All right, thank you. Praise the Lord. Uh, Sister Shanice, you have a particular, you wrote a particular testimony here. I just copied it and pasted it to my, to my notes, so I'll read it later. I wasn't able to read it. Is that okay? Yeah, that's um, fine. Okay, so I'll read it later and then we'll get back in touch with you. So this is a uh, uh, Bible study with Ramide Dawson on Revive Living Waters platform. 
um, Revived Living Waters um, is a ministry platform, a ministry dedicated to, of course, you, to spreading the word of God everywhere. We have pastors, we have apostles, we have prophets, evangelists from all over the world on our platform. We have almost daily programs on our, uh, what's, on our what's this, like? Zoom, Abby? On our Zoom platform, yeah? And uh, we also have a Facebook page. It's called Revived Living Waters. It's on Facebook. Um, join up and um, let's get edified and let's 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 receive the blessing of God.